the American Civil War, the great American conflict that split the nation in two between the Northern Union and the Southern Confederacy. What was a more important American event, apart from perhaps the American Revolution, to seal the idea of a nation that made a people American? And yet, taking part in this conflict were hundreds of thousands of non-Americans, either those who themselves did not view themselves as Americans, or were not viewed by others to be American, people from across the sea and different nations that took part in this great conflict. And in today's video, I'd like to look specifically at the involvement of the Irish in the American Civil War. As over 150,000 Irishmen fought for the North and around 20,000 Irishmen fought for the South in this conflict. Irishmen from all across the island of Ireland served all throughout the United and Confederate States of America in the great four year struggle. And in this video, I want to shine a light on their experience of both men and women, those who fought and those who did not fight in the American Civil War. What were their motivations and what were their experiences like? Let's first take a look at why there were so many Irishmen in America to begin with. This in particular can be brought back to the year 1845, the year in which the Irish potato famine or the Great Hunger began in Ireland. This would lead to the deaths of around a million people and would lead to a reduction in population from anywhere from 20 to 25% due to death and immigration. We know that in the period of the famine from 1846 to 1851 alone, around a million Irishmen went to America, adding to a comparable number already in the United States from earlier emigration, thus bringing the total number of Irishmen in the United States in 1860 to around a million 600,000 people. Most of these emigrants would go to the large cities in the north and east of the United States, as we can see here on this map. Although following this initial migration, some of them would strike out into the hinterland, for example, working on railroads and canals and other large construction projects as unskilled laborers and cheap laborers. Most Irish emigration was urban. The vast, vast majority of Irishmen came in at the port of New York and stayed there, although the second most popular destination was the southern harbour of New Orleans. There were other cities in the northeast as well, such as Philadelphia and Boston, that soon gained large numbers of Irishmen, as well as somewhat less in Buffalo. There were others in Chicago and St. Louis. And in the south, there were really rather much smaller Irish communities in Charleston and Savannah, with some rural Irish emigration as well. But these were the main areas to which the Irish moved upon reaching the United States. To give an indication of some of the numbers involved, we can see that in the census of 1860, there were around 200,000 Irish-born people living in New York. Of course, the ethnic Irish population being even larger with some second-generation or third-generation immigrants already and other family members being born in the United States, but for all intents and purposes being Irish. That is compared with the second largest Irish community, which was that of the state of Louisiana, which numbered just 28,000 in comparison. Already before the outbreak of the Civil War, many of these Irishmen joined the Army and the Navy in the United States. In fact, in 1860, they numbered around 60% of the United States Army was Irish-born, as many of them were unskilled laborers and the Army offered a possible pathway for social advancement as well as good money. It's no surprise then that at the very first attack of the Civil War, the Confederate assault on Fort Sumter, that the Irish were intrinsically involved. We have around 40% of the Union garrison at Fort Sumter were indeed born in Ireland. And the apparent first gunner to fire on Confederate positions from the Union side, he claimed to be James Gibbons, who was from Ireland himself. And actually the first casualty of the Civil War the following day after the surrender of Fort Sumter was during a barrage in which one of the cannons misfired and thus killed Daniel Hoff, who was also an Irish-born man, and several other Irishmen would later die from their wounds after this cannon misfired. Fired. So at the very beginning of the Civil War, we already see the involvement of the Irish. 
Most Irishmen, however, would be recruited in the wake of the beginning of hostilities in 1861 into volunteer and later conscripted battalions. These are just a few of the either entirely Irish or largely Irish battalions. Some of these would have an incredibly Irish character and might be called an Irish unit or an ethnic Irish unit, whereas it was almost always the case that not everyone in such a unit was actually from Ireland. Others might have been born in the United States but were part of the Irish American community and others might simply have been Americans that ended up enrolled in them. So why might these Irishmen want to go and fight for the Union apart from the obvious economic incentive of getting pay as a soldier? Well, for one of these regiments, we actually know what was said at a committee meeting to try and lure new volunteers to join. And that was for the 69th New York Infantry Regiment, which would later become part of the Irish Brigade. Now, this one was actually already founded in one form in 1849, and several of the founding members and commanders were Irishmen who had taken part in a failed rebellion against the British in 1848. And one of these was this gentleman, Thomas Francis Maher, who had been a key figure in organising the rebellion. He had fought against the British and was captured. He was then sent to Australia, but escaped along the way and made his way to the United States of America instead. And it was on the 6th of October 1861, following his daring escape and arrival in the United States, that he gave a speech in New York to try and persuade Irish men and people of the Irish American community to join his new volunteer battalion that would fight against the South. And we have some excerpts from the speech from which we can glean the points that he raised. First of all, he noted the fact that Irishmen had often been employed in foreign armies, noting the wild geese that had fought alongside French troops, as well as Irishmen that had fought alongside the Spanish, and even the fame of the Irishmen that were currently and had fought in the British army. He then went on to note the importance that that American Republican ideal uh, should be upheld. The idea that Irishmen in America could vote, be part of the government system, and practice their religion and customs, and that that was being threatened by the current rebellion. He also noted the unjustified violence of southern states against their adopted homeland of the United States, and that the South had started the war in his eyes, as well as claiming that fighting for the Union would help Irish emigrants who were often discriminated against by native-born Americans become more an essential part of American society and would cement their place as Americans by fighting. He also noted that Southerners, in a way, were creating a similar social structure to that of the British, which of course were the big enemy of many of the Irish who had fled British rule to come to North America. And finally, he noted that there were many pro-Confederate leanings in Britain who had some time before fought a war against the United States, and he feared that a weakened Union would be unable to stand up for Ireland against the British if they remained severed. And so, recreating the Union, bringing the South back into the fold, was essential for any Irishman who wanted American support against the British for Ireland. A reason that is often given for Irish support for the United States in the Civil War is because they wanted to go back to Ireland with new military experience and take on the British. This is related to an idea called Fenianism, with the Fenians being an underground movement trying to undermine British rule in Ireland. And while this is certainly true, and there were certain organisations like the Irish Republican Brotherhood that had members fighting for both the North and the South, this wasn't actually a major factor for most of the Irish that were employed in either the Northern or Southern armies during the Civil War, although it was the case for some of the more high-ranking members who formed circles within the army that would later on go and try and liberate Ireland from the British. However, for most Irishmen fighting in the war, this wasn't a major concern. Also, because of the film Gangs of New York, there is a very famous scene when Irishmen coming straight off the boat are immediately enlisted into the Union Army, often under false pretenses. This press ganging, while we know that some of it did go on, there isn't actually an awful lot of evidence, and takes away quite a bit from the actual agency of the Irish themselves, hundreds of thousands of whom came forward of their own volition to go and fight for the Union, although many of them did come from the very poor 
poorest strata of society and so one wonders if economically they had much of a choice but it doesn't seem to be the case for the majority of Irishmen that they went into service with anything but a clear idea of what they were signing up for even if the horrors of war are really hard to prepare for. So what can we actually say about some of these Irishmen that joined these units? Well, for one unit, which was largely Irish, the 23rd Illinois, there were quite detailed records kept of where most of the men actually came from. And from this, we found that of the place of origin, when it was recorded for soldiers enlisted in this unit, over 50% were born in Ireland. And many of the others, judging by their surnames, were certainly ethnically Irish, even if they'd been born in the States, or their place of origin hadn't been noted. Now, this is a very rough map of where these provinces are in Ireland, or the counties are, and we can see how many of the men came from each county, from which we see that there is a quite clear split that most of the men came from the southern or the western counties, as we show here with Mayo, Galway, Clare, Cork, Kerry, Limerick, and Tipperary supplying by far the most men, uh, and quite a few from Dublin, as is to be expected because it is geographically larger. What's also interesting is that the vast majority of men uh, whose uh, birthplace is in the United States is in New York and that many of them had later on then moved further inland to Illinois but that most had either been born in New York or had come through the port of New York when emigrating into the United States which is very interesting. Others we have that an older brother was born in Ireland and a younger brother serving in the same regiment had been born in the United States but both had chosen to serve with this very ethnically Irish brigade that they were fighting with. Now, several of these units did have a very strong ethnic character. And these are sometimes called green flag brigades because apart from the national colours of the stars and stripes, they would also carry into battle green flags, most often bearing the harp of Aaron as well as their regimental insignia and others. And there were several such brigades that existed in the Union Army. However, what seems to be the case is that the majority of Irishmen that fought in the American Civil War didn't actually fight in these ethnic units at all, but rather served alongside other Americans and those from elsewhere that had emigrated to America, rather than being in specifically Irish battalions and groups. And we can actually see this if we look at the recipients of the Medal of Honor. And from these, we know that 146 of the recipients of this medal in the American Civil War were born in Ireland, which is a staggering 10% of the total. There is no other nationality that is more represented apart from the Irish in the recipients of the Medal of Honor, apart from Americans, of course, that should be clear. But what's interesting is that over 125 of those Irish born that received the Medal of Honor in the Civil War came from non-Irish ethnic units so were interspersed among units uh, with Americans and other nationalities as well. We also know that the Irish were quite heavily involved in the higher ranks in the COs and NCOs of the army. We know that for the state of New York units that were raised there there were 25 Irish-born colonels commanding regiments there. Now, this is mostly based on evidence for soldiers and units fighting for the North, fighting for the Union. As, as I mentioned, the vast majority of Irishmen both lived in the Northern States and subsequently served in the units of the Northern States. However, there were also Irishmen that fought for the South and Irishmen that lived in the South. And for the entire Confederate Army, we have just 11 Irish-born colonels commanding regiments. So a huge distinction with just New York having 25 and only 11. But that doesn't mean that Irishmen couldn't advance up the ranks in the Confederate Army, as we'll see later on. For the Confederates, there were far fewer ethnically Irish brigades or battalions raised. The only one really being the 10th Tennessee Infantry Regiment that was an ethnic Irish brigade. However, there were several Confederate formations that were either largely or had entire sort of smaller units within them that were ethnically Irish, including the 5th Confederate Infantry, largely from Memphis, the 24th Georgia Infantry, whose insignia also showed the Harp of Era, the 6th Louisiana Infantry, the famous Louisiana Tigers, 
and the Missouri Volunteer Militia, all of them having a large degree of Irishmen fighting under their banners. So having gone through all the previous reasons about why the Irish fought for the North and to preserve the Union, why did some Irishmen in the South go and fight for the Confederates? Well, there were several reasons for this as well. First of all, it seems that there was generally less discrimination against Irish immigrants in the South than there was in the large urban areas in the North. And this probably came down to the fact that in the South, there was a very set and established hierarchy that was based on race, as we would recognize it today, rather than on ethnicity. And in this way, even though there was a, a larger upper class white or Anglo group that did potentially also look down on some of the Irish immigrants that came in, there was a very clear caste distinction between a free white population and an unfree black population. And in that way, it was easier for the Irish to integrate into that free white identity because there was that juxtaposition with an unfree black identity, which of course was not the case in the North, where in most of the states there, slavery had been outlawed. And so the Irish were at the bottom, the bottom rung of the social ladder, which was different in the South. Secondly, it does appear that most Irishmen in the South were initially against secession, unlike most of the native-born Southerners, but that once secession had occurred, they did then go and support it, but often to a somewhat smaller level than most of the native-born Southerners. What was important for the Irish was that most of them were strong backers of the Democrat Party, remembering, of course, that Abraham Lincoln was a Republican on his abolitionist platform. Um, well, most of the Irish were also strongly anti-abolitionism. They did not want slavery to be revoked because as the Irish were already very low down on the social ladder, they were many of the laborers, dock workers, rail workers, workers on canals, particularly around New Orleans. If black slaves were free, then that would be a whole new lower workforce flooding the labor market and thus creating competition for the Irish. So economically, they did not want slavery to be repealed. And finally, the idea of a struggle for freedom against a larger power and the creation of a nation state was something that the Irish could very much get behind because of their own history with the British. Some Irishmen really did wholeheartedly support the Confederacy and came very far. One such was Patrick Cleburne, who would actually attain the highest rank of any military officer on either side of the American Civil War, attaining the rank of Major General in the Confederate Army. His tactics in the Western Theater in the Army of Tennessee would lead to him being dubbed the Stonewall of the West by some of his fellow commanders, and he would receive high praise from the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Many suggested he would have achieved an even higher position had it not been for a very controversial statement that he told the Confederate government in 1864, and that was that he believed they should immediately commence training a large reserve of the most courageous of our slaves, and further that we guarantee freedom within a reasonable time to every slave in the South who shall remain true to the Confederacy in this war. As between the loss of independence and the loss of slavery, we assume that every patriot will freely give up the latter, give up the Negro slaves rather than be a slave himself. However, as we all know, slavery was the cornerstone of the existence of the Confederacy, and so the Confederate government found this proposal to be absolutely preposterous. And in the end, they would only actually arm several slaves in the very last months of the war, and they would not see combat. So Patrick Cleburne was somewhat shunned by the Confederacy at large, despite the fact that he was a very able commander, and that militarily this did make sense. He would in 1864 be killed at the Battle of Franklin, fighting against Union soldiers. So were there ever any occasions when the Irish soldiers fighting for the South met Irish soldiers fighting for the North? Well, yes, there most certainly were. As I said already, most of the soldiers, the Irish soldiers that served, were in non-Irish ethnic units, so they would actually be clashing against one another all the time, but alongside soldiers of other nationalities too. 
Although there are some occasions when we do know that several of these ethnic brigades actually did fight against one another. One such is in 1861 at the First Battle of Bull Run or Manassas, when several of the very first casualties of the Day of Union forces were Irishmen and that were killed from regiments from Louisiana, from New Orleans specifically, many of whom had Irish soldiers among their number. And so it's likely that some of those first Irish casualties that were killed in the 69th were killed by their countrymen who had emigrated to the south rather than to the north. As New Orleans was the second most popular destination for Irish emigrants in North America. However, the most famous example that has become memorialized of Irishmen fighting against Irishmen in the Civil War was the 1862 Battle of Fredericksburg. During this battle, the Irish Brigade would be made to climb up the Maris Heights elevation to attack the Confederate positions as they were concealed behind a stone wall. Of the Irish Brigade's 1,000 men that made that journey, only around half would return down the hill, a huge casualty rate that would decimate the regiment, but that would make it go down in history as one of the most famous engagements that it would fight. Not least because those that were firing back against them were the 24th Georgia Infantry, most of them also Irishmen, commanded by Thomas Cobb. And it's thanks to this engagement that apparently the regiment got its own nickname of the fight in 69th, which was given to it by none other than General Lee, although that story is somewhat ambiguous as to it whether it happened. In any case, the scene is quite movingly incorporated into the film Gods and Generals, for which it has received critical acclaim and has become more famous, and it certainly was noted at the time as well. An interesting story as well from some of the prisoners of the Irish Brigade that were sent to the infamous Confederate prison of Andersonville is that they were asked if they wanted to be recruited into the 10th Tennessee Irish Brigade, the Confederate Irish Brigade, rather than remain in captivity. Although the source tells us that they did not, in fact, any of them go over to fight for them, but two Americans, non-Irishmen, did actually join the Confederates. Following such engagements, like Fredericksburg and Antietam with horrific casualties on the Union side and in the Irish brigades in particular, by 1863 many Irishmen had become rather suspicious of the war, even including such rhetoric as that the Republican-led government was purposefully sending Irish units into the meat grinder because they had no respect for Irish Catholic and Democrat lives. This was further, uh, this situation became worse in 1863 by two decisions made by the government. The first was the Emancipation Proclamation that freed all the slaves in North America. And the second was the draft. Now areas in the North would have to fill a quota of men to be enlisted into the army or they would have a draft by which they would force men into the army that couldn't pay a $300 commutation fee in order to arrange for a substitute to take their place. Now, of course, the Irish were the very poorest in society in the North, and so a laborer's wages could never pay $300. And now the fact that they were poor meant that they would soon be shipped off to go and fight and die in the horrific meat grinder style battles of 1862 in 1863 and this created outrage in the Irish communities and the larger working class communities in northeastern cities particularly in New York. The Irish were largely incensed at the fact that they would now be forced to go out and fight for a small pay whilst others in the community the wealthier for example who could pay that $300 or African Americans who were also exempt from the draft did not have to. These riots targeted all institutions related to the army, including many homes of Irish soldiers themselves and Irish officers who were killed, as well as the police, many of whom were also Irish because these were once again the largest ethnic group in the working classes. 
they also took a rather darker turn, as well as fighting against figures of authority, because this was now being seen as a war to free slaves, as Lincoln had announced the Emancipation Proclamation, they also turned their anger against members of the African American community, lynching several in the streets, and in one particularly horrifying episode, setting fire to a school or an orphanage for black Americans in the area, although thankfully no orphans were caught in the attack on the school that occurred. This continued for several days in New York City before calm was restored. And by the time the smoke had cleared, around 120 people had lost their lives. That didn't mean that all the Irish were suddenly against the war, even though that was the feeling in many of the places back home in the Northeast. In fact, we have accounts from soldiers at the front who are horrified by the reports they're hearing of what their fellow countrymen had done in the cities. One such was Peter Welsh, a private from the 28th Massachusetts Infantry, the Irish Brigade, who wrote home to his wife on the 17th of July 1863 saying, I am sorry to hear that there is such disgraceful riots in New York. I hope it will not get near to you or annoy you. I read a full account of it in yesterday's paper. The report was up to 12 o'clock Wednesday night. I see they tried the virtue of grape and canister, those are types of shell that they use in cannons, on them, and it had a very good effect. The originators of those riots should be hung like dogs. They are agents of Jeff Davis and had their plans laid to start those riots simultaneously with Lee's raid into Pennsylvania. I hope the authorities will use canister freely. It will bring the bloody cutthroats to their senses. However, these riots would have a lasting effect on how the Irish were viewed in America. There had already been plenty of prejudice against them beforehand, but these riots now cemented for many the idea that the Irish were draft dodgers, they didn't want to work, and that they were simply fighting against authorities and leeching off the harder working Anglo-American population. And this fed into more racism in the future, as well as tarnishing the name of those Irish Irishmen that were out on the front lines and fighting all the time. And yet, in many cases, this couldn't be further from the truth, as that raid of Lees into Pennsylvania that Private Walsh was talking about was, of course, that which would culminate in the famous Battle of Gettysburg, largely seen as the turning point in the American Civil War. And all throughout this battle on the Union side, Irishmen played a key role, being essential in the part of the line that pulled back against Pickett's charge and thus swung the Civil War as it's often thought of in the popular imagination. Now I've talked a lot about Irish men fighting in the army but there were also some very memorable Irish women that also did their bit on various sides and one of these is Irish Biddy, most likely called Bridget Diver or some variation thereof, who has taken on a somewhat mythical story or collection of stories since she was was alive. Now, it's most often thought that she accompanied one of the Michigan regiments into battle, and one of the sources describes some of her actions. It says, From the horde of fugitives dashed Irish Biddy, soiled by the bullets that had swept through her clothing. On her head rested a regulation army cap, fastened with the necessary feminine hat pin. Her hair had escaped from its confinement and was whipping about her face, that was begrimed as her clothing. Irish Biddy reached the side of the wounded soldier who was her husband. He was too feeble to help himself. The woman raised him to his feet and she half dragged and half carried him across the battlefield. Now this is a very interesting account, not least because the Michigan regiment that she was supposed to be a part of never fought at the Battle of Fair Oaks, which just shows how these kinds of legends spread throughout the army. Another that's particularly interesting for me is the similarities this bears with the idea of the Valkyrie in the Old Norse mythology, as these are also warrior women that are incredibly brave and sort of rescue men from across the battlefield and uh, carry them back to safety just goes to show that these are often sort of fantasies that men have in these obviously largely male fighting units when on the front line. But it does appear that there was such a character as Bridget, as there are many accounts of her actions, some appearing more true than others, that existed. Or whether this account is of a a different Irish woman that also showed extreme heroism in saving her husband isn't known. 
There's another very interesting character that fought on the other side, or, well, rather than fought, served on the other side, and she is often referred to as Florence Nightingale of the Confederacy, her real name being Mary Sophia Hill. She came to the United States to New Orleans with her brother Sam, and Sam then later joined the Confederate Army, but she didn't think this was a good mix, and also joined in with the regiment acting as a nurse and treating many soldiers throughout the various battles, including her own brother Sam when he was grievously wounded by a cannon. After the Union's capture of New Orleans in 1862, she would continue to help Confederate wounded and would actually be captured and arrested by Union forces and put in prison on charges of spying, although she would later be released. The effect that she had on those Confederate men that she helped throughout the war continued to be felt even after the war. And when she died in 1902, and a funeral was attended by many of the veterans whose lives she had helped to save. This was written about the funeral by a Confederate veteran uh, magazine uh, that visited in New Orleans. It said, Through the streets of New Orleans, at an early morning hour, marched a long line of aged men wearing grey uniforms, with bowed heads and saddened hearts. Before them was the born the remains of a woman whom they had known in adversity and had honoured as a queen among Southern sympathisers. The Florence Nightingale of the Army of Northern Virginia was dead, and its surviving veterans sought to show their love and appreciation by burying her with military honours, an unusual and beautiful occurrence. Of course, by 1865, the Irish fighting on both sides would be freed from the shackles of the war as the war came to an end at a Potomac's courthouse. Around 30,000 Irishmen would be killed in the struggle between the states. However, many, many more would survive the battle but would be equally traumatized mentally and physically by their experiences in the war, having had either one or several limbs amputated, having lost sight, and of course the mental ramifications of the things that they had seen and seen themselves do in the war would live with them. For those who had died, they left behind families in both Ireland and in various places in the United States who would then be reliant on the meager pensions that they could expect to survive, especially difficult in an age where it was very hard for women to survive without the help of a man in such a society. Now, after the Civil War, already quite soon, several of these Irish regiments would bring about uh, memorials for those who had fought and died at various places, such as this one for the Irish Brigade at the Battle of Gettysburg, the first of the Gettysburg memorials and uh, communions together being in 1887, when those who had fought on both sides of Pickett's Charge, those on the receiving Union end being part of the Irish Brigade, actually meeting over the stone wall and posing for photographs. It was in 1912, on the anniversary of the Battle of Fredericksburg, that there would be another such meeting between members of the Irish Brigade of the 69th and other regiments in New York that would come together and would host a dinner, but by that time there were already far fewer of them still alive. The last of the Union Irish Brigade from the 69th would die in 1947, his name being Henry Minge. However, for those Irishmen that fought for the Confederates, their last one of those would die in 1950. And his name was Jeremiah O'Brien, who had amazingly joined up in 1864 and who said that he was with Lee at the surrender at Apotomax. Am I saying that right? Apotomax? Oh, it's Apomattox Courthouse at the surrender there. And he would go on to live a very long life, actually qualifying. He was born in 1844 in Limerick in Ireland before coming over to the uh, America. And in 1865, he would go on to ask for a Confederate pension, which he would receive. And he would still be receiving that all the way up to his death in 1950, which is absolutely incredible that that lifespan and the memory of the Irish brigades that fought would continue on for such a long time to 1950. 
And even more amazing is the fact that just 11 years later, in 1961, John F. Kennedy, himself the descendant of Irish immigrants to the United States, would become the President of America. Now just think, when Jeremiah O'Brien came to the Americas, the Irish were still very much seen as second-class citizens that couldn't be trusted, couldn't be paid the same amount, and just weren't actually even part of the same ethnic group as many of the sort of Anglo-Americans or nativists saw, and that just 11 years after his death, one of those would be the most powerful man in the United States of America is, is quite amazing to consider. But John F. Kennedy also would become, in 1963, the first American president to visit the Republic of Ireland. And when he did so, he brought with him one of the flags that was used at or well, that was used after the Battle of Fredericksburg by the Irish Brigade. Today, in recognition of what these gallant Irishmen and what millions of other Irish have done for my country and through the generosity of the Fighting 69th, I would like to present one of these flags to the people of Ireland. However, by 1963, and actually what still holds true today, is that while the American president was very aware of the Irish involvement in the American Civil War, most in Ireland are absolutely not aware of that Irish presence fighting in the American Civil War at all. As most of the time, those Irishmen that stayed in the United States did not come back to Ireland, those that had fought. And so they sort of disappeared from the Irish consciousness, whereas in America that is somewhat more recognized and continually so to this day. I think that's a really great shame because obviously these stories are incredibly important and they involve large numbers of people. Hundreds of thousands of Irishmen fought and many of them died in this conflict that was so integral to the idea of American nationhood and on both sides as well. It's somewhat comparable to the scenario of those that fought in the First World War from Ireland, who for a long, long time were also very much neglected and left out of Irish history, although with the centenary that has just come and gone several years ago of the First World War, they have somewhat been reintroduced into the Irish history books as they had been left out for a very long time. And as we can see, actually, these figures are very similar for those who fought in the First World War, around 200,000 and around 35,000 killed, compared to Irishmen in the American Civil War of around 170,000 native-born Irishmen involved and around 30,000 killed. So perhaps in the future we will get more recognition from the Irish themselves, the country of Ireland, in an official status as well as perhaps culturally about those Irishmen that went to the uh, North American continent and fought in the American Civil War on both sides. But do let me know in the comments below, did you know about the Irish in the American Civil War? And if so, how did you find out? And do you think that those in Ireland should be more aware of this history and of those of their countrymen that left the Emerald Isle and signed up on both sides to fight in the American Civil War? Let me know in the comments below. It will be completely unjust of me to not now mention the book that I read and greatly enjoyed by the historian Damien Shields about the Irish in the American Civil War. It's a fantastic book. I absolutely flew through it on my Kindle uh, and I found out so, so much, a lot of which has made its way into this video. So if you found this video interesting and want to find out more, particularly about the individual stories of Irishmen that served on both sides in the American Civil War, then I couldn't recommend that book highly enough or of the blog which is called Irish in the American Civil War which he runs together with several other people then I would greatly recommend for you to go and check that out. Let me know in the comments below are there any other groups that were involved in the American Civil War that you would like to see me make a video on. I already have a few of these topics in mind but if you have something you would like to make me make a video about uh, concerning the American Civil War then let me know and I will do my best to fulfill that wish if it lines up with some of the other ideas that I have. Anyway, until then, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.